what we're talking about uh, today um, are waves. I was thinking about um, waves of mercy from God over the over the years. Uh, you and I have experienced different uh, different times. God has shown His mercy, and there's this song. It's it, it's called Waves of Mercy, Waves of Grace. And everywhere I look, I see your face. And so it's this, this song about recognizing God's mercy and his favor for you. And so just as you're thinking right now about the different times you experienced his, his grace and his mercy. So waves of mercy. Um, also uh, thinking about uh, waves, uh, different kind of waves. Um, there's this wave in Montana that goes like this. That's it. That's it. When we were traveling back to um, bring Josh to um, Bible school back in Chicago, we drove across the country, and it was the strangest thing. We get to the border of Montana, and we get into Montana, and every single vehicle going past us waved, and they waved like this. And I said, is this a cool place? Are they friendly around here? It's like this. Oh, oh, if it's on your steering wheel, so we're talking from a man born in Montana. He said, or you just stick your finger up like that. So we, we traveled through Montana, and boy, I was just having fun. You know, everybody was waving. And as soon as we crossed the line, I kept waving, and nobody waved back. It was like, what? Wow, that is so weird. Montana, way to go. The wave. And so there's the parade wave, you know, you got the parade wave. And then, uh, I, oh, you got this wave for somebody that you know that really cares about you. You got this wave so no one else can see it. You just kind of, oh, I got to stand up here and do it. So my, uh, my daughter goes like this. She says, hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. It's down here. It's like we got this little wave going. And Nicole knows that too. We have different waves. And then when we were at the kingdom, they, back in the day, right, the kingdom, anybody remember that hamburger looking thing, kingdom? That's when I experienced the wave. Do you remember that? And I don't know if they still do that, but it started over here and people would stand up and go and go and go. I want to try that just for fun. Just pretend, (laughs) pretend you're kids, okay? Just pretend you're kids right now. You don't have to stand up, just your hand. And so as I walk past you, I want you to just raise your hand and bring it down, okay? So I'm going to pretend I'm way over here, Dale. Okay, ready? Here we go. Here we go. Here we got the way. Okay, here we go. Yeah, and now we're going to go back, so you have to go. Okay, here we go. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. It's coming. There we go. All right. So if you guys didn't get to experience the kingdom wave, there it is. There it is. You got it. What's that? What about the ball? The ball. I don't know. But... Throw the ball around too. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Around the horn. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so finally, I want to talk about what I saw in Scripture this, this last week. Um, do you know that in the military, there, there are waves of, of, of military campaign? Like, for instance, the first wave of a military campaign may be through the air right? Missiles and, and planes. And that maybe the second wave might be um, uh, tanks and that sort of thing. Uh, different, And then the infantrymen would, would come. So just saying that that may be a way that through uh, years ago that a, a military campaign happened. But the, as I was looking at scripture this last week, um, it appeared to me that there were, there was uh, five waves of advancing the gospel. It was like the first wave came, and this is to the Gentiles. These, this is to finally the doors were open from the apostles to the Gentiles through Peter, and now it was happening all over the place where the Gentiles were receiving the message of God. And what I saw were five waves, and the first wave that happened was the persecution that happened in uh, Jerusalem when, when, the, uh, uh, when the first martyr, Stephen, when he was first martyred and there was persecution happening. And you know who led that charge? Was Saul, where he was a, a, 
a terrorist. You could call him a terrorist. And he was even standing there receiving the, the robes and the coats from the people that were stoning, uh, stoning Stephen. And then God got hold of him and shook him up, right? And he began to, to write almost all the, uh, so much of the New Testament. He was completely changed. God did a work in him. So, um, but that persecution, we're talking about that persecution. So the first wave that went out from Jerusalem were people running for their lives from this persecution. And as they went, they were sharing the gospel as they went. This first wave went out. And so what it appeared to me was that this was a strange way for God to send the first wave of, of his kingdom, his advancing his kingdom by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come into people and they couldn't shut up. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you can't shut up and you talk about Jesus and his great love for you and what he did on the cross and he's the Messiah, the Holy Spirit. And that happens to us even today as we're given to the Holy Spirit, we can't stop sharing what God has done. And there's people that need to be saved. So open up to Acts chapter 11. And uh, we are at verse 19, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. So verse 19 is that first wave of the Holy Spirit advancing the kingdom of God, that first wave. And so listen to what happens here. It says here that um, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, and Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word of God to no one but the Jews only. So that first wave went to the Jews only. Okay, so there were Jews being persecuted, went out, and they were telling other Jews. And that, so that's the first wave. And of course, the persecution of Stephen. Let me, let me go back there. So we're going to stay in Acts for a bit, but to go back a couple of pages to uh, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, and let's just uh, look at Stephen again, or go back to 6, I guess. Acts chapter 6. So we're still in Acts chapter 6. And let's look at um, this call of Stephen. um, Verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So it was serving the tables, um, serving this abundance that the Holy Spirit came upon the first church, and they were sharing with everybody, and there were some people that were being overlooked. And so uh, the apostles said, we need some helpers. And the helpers were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. You mean just just helping? Just helping uh, share food? <laughs> That's God's requirement, full of the Holy Spirit. Even when you serve food, even when you clean the bathroom, even when, even when you do dishes, full of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you get exhausted? Not if you're full of the Holy Spirit. So, verse 4, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the multitude, and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And then it names other people there too. Now, this, this Stephen or Stephen, uh, he couldn't stop talking about God. Verse 8, so we're in chapter 6, verse 8. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose what was called, um, from what was called the synagogue of the freedman, um, Syrians and Alexandrians, um, from those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Okay, so much so that he got in trouble and he went against the council. And I want you to drop over to, let's go to chapter 7 of Acts. So Stephen, in front of the council, gives a history lesson that they cannot deny about God's people uh, from Abraham on and coming through Moses. So verse 37 of Acts chapter 7, 37. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is the one 
who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. So the, the, the law, right? Verse uh, 39, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. So he goes on t- telling them how in history, his own people turned away from God and they, their hearts were wanted to go back to Egypt. So they really didn't want to listen to God. And so in his, uh, he talks about the calf they made and they, they turned to worship, not God, but this, this image of this, uh, this calf. Drop down to v- verse 51. So we're still in Acts chapter 7, verse 51. And then he just can't hold back anymore. And he says, you stiff necked and uncircumcised in your heart and your ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you, which the prophets did your fathers. um, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers. You have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So when he blasted the leadership of Israel, 54, they turned and heard these things. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed him at him with their teeth. And he being full of the Holy Spirit, verse 55, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing in the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They stoned Stephen. And as he was calling on God and saying, Lord, receive my spirit, he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So, when this started to happen, Peter, uh, uh, Stephen was the first one killed. A persecution then went out and they were trying to gather all those. So they were so angry at this message, this new message that Jesus was the Messiah, that anybody that was saying Jesus was in big trouble. So they were scattered. So in chapter 11, we see that first wave of those running for their lives um, from this persecution that was happening, that they were going to kill, they were going to torture, they were going to put into prison, they were going to confiscate all that they had. So here's that first wave of persecution as they were going through Phoenicia, so we're back in Acts chapter 11, and Cyprus, and then to Antioch, they were preaching the word um, to the Jews only. So this is that first wave. Isn't that cool? As they were going, they were preaching the word. What was the word? Well, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. The word that they were preaching is Jesus, Jesus Christ. He is the word of God. So they were preaching the word as they were going. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one that they were missing, that they were denying. So that was the message that we're going. He is the anointed one. Second wave. Second wave. Um, In verse 20, 20 through 21. Here's the second wave. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. So now here's the second wave. It's not just to the Jews. There were some of them that felt moved by the Holy Spirit to now speak to uh, the Hellenists who were um, Jews that it sounds like they were uh, living away from Jerusalem. And so there's uh, really kind of two camps of Jews. The first camp is those who were believing Jews who lived near and around Jerusalem, uh, uh, and they remained in uh, Judea. 
and they used the Hebrew language, and so they were called Hebrews. And then there was another group of Jews that were scattered in countries where, the, um, where they were Gentiles. So they were living, and probably um, their kids were born and living, and they were Greek-speaking Jews. Interesting. So over here, they stayed with the Hebrew language. Over here, now they're, they're Hebrew people, but they were Greek-speaking and not Hebrew-speaking. So there were some people that were running away from Jerusalem that went to this group of people that were maybe being ignored by that first wave that were going to their own, and maybe they were just comfortable speaking their own language, and now there was another group moved by the Spirit of God to speak to the Greek-speaking Jews called the Hellenists or the Grecians. And so they were speaking to them. And it says there, In verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Does that impress it? So here's the first wave of advancing the kingdom by the Holy Spirit. People moved by God on the run. (laughs) And here's the second group on the run, but they see this other patchwork of Jews that were even practicing some of the Greek ways. And so they were sharing with them. Is that a beautiful thing? So that second wave of advancing the kingdom of God. And it says here that they were preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, up in the first wave, it says they were preaching the word. Well, apparently that's one and the same. They were preaching the Lord Jesus. They were preaching the word. Is it interesting to you that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. One day, every knee is going to bow. But, but Jesus, he is Lord and master of all. He is creator. He is God. So no wonder there's such a, a fight whenever anybody talks about Jesus in the right way. No wonder there's such a fight because we're saying, He's the judge. You're going to come before Jesus and you're going to bend a knee whether you want to or not. He is ruler of all. He is Lord of all. Amazing. And so they were teaching the Lord Jesus. They were sharing um, the word. Okay. So about, um, we keep finding out that they end up at Antioch. So that first wave went to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and then Antioch. And then this uh, second wave, there were some people from Cyprus and Cyrene, um, they end up in Antioch. So here's, it seems to be this destination that the Holy Spirit is heading to and then growing the first church of Gentiles in Antioch. Okay? So I thought, how far away is that from Jerusalem? So if they're running from Jerusalem... Uh, Cyprus is about 300 miles or so from Jerusalem, 300 miles or so. And, and so then uh, uh, Phoenicia maybe is a little less than that. Um, Antioch is maybe, maybe about 400 miles away. So then I thought, just to give me some perspective, where's that from here? Well, uh, the Oregon border probably is about 389 miles, so about that far. So they, had, they were fleeing that far. They were on the run that far. They got that far away. Uh, let's see, where else? Uh, Missoula, Montana. 402 miles. So we run over to Missoula, Montana. Okay. I wonder how long that would take on foot. Any idea how long that would take on foot? I didn't look that up. Maybe you could do that for me. How long would that take? On the run, they had to eat and sleep and but people were chasing them. They were heading out to find a safe place. Um, now, if you want to go up into Canada, Calgary is uh, 384 miles. All right. Moscow, Idaho, 385. You head over there. Spokane. I, I didn't know. Spokane, could it really be 384 miles? God, I, I'm not sure. I have to recheck my facts there. Um, so anyways, uh, but... It seemed to be that Antioch was where people were ending up. Okay. So that second wave then, a great number uh, believed and turned to the Lord. Okay. The third wave 
the third wave of the Holy Spirit advancing the kingdom of God through people that were on the run. Um, It turns out that, uh, verse 22, the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. So they heard of all these people coming to faith in Christ way over there, 400 miles away in Antioch and these other places. They decide to send out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now, before I read any more, why, in your Bible reading and stuff, why would they, of all people, send Barnabas to this new church that's growing? Why Barnabas? Anybody have an idea? Why would they send Barnabas? They trusted him. him. Okay? So here's the church back here, the apostles back here, and Barnabas. They... They chose Barnabas, and they sent him 400 miles to that church. Why Barnabas? Anybody else? They trusted him. Yes. His name name meant son of encouragement. And so they wanted to encourage these new believers. And so Barnabas, the biggest name, the biggest guy they had ever witnessed of that encouragement, they said, you go. You go, we're going to send you. We're going to send our best man out there to encourage this young church. Isn't that cool? God's plan, his third wave was to send Barnabas of advancing the kingdom. Needed, they needed to have him. So let's read in verse uh, 23, let's see. Yes, 20, 22 through 24. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch, verse 23. And when he came and had seen the grace God of God, he was glad and guess what he did? He encouraged them all that with the purpose of heart should continue with the Lord. Continue with the Lord. That's amazing. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the church. So he, they sent Barnabas. So let's, let's do a little look for Barnabas. So go back to Acts chapter 4, the first place we hear about Barnabas. He, when the Holy Spirit came upon the first church after they received, uh, um, the power and the love went out and Barnabas was, was selling his land or sold some of his land. Okay, verse uh, chapter 4. Um, Verse 36, and Joseph, or Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite from the country of Cyprus. Wait a minute, he's not far from his home. At least he's closer than Jerusalem, right? Having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here's the first time we hear about uh, Barnabas, this son of encouragement. Um, Let's go to um, chapter 9, and let's read about Barnabas again. Just what kind of man Barnabas is. So chapter 9, we're we're staying in Acts. Chapter 9, verse 26, I think is what I have here. 26. Yes, chapter 9, 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem... So after uh, Saul was uh, converted by the Lord, uh, Saul came to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Verse 27, but Barnabas. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so he was with them in Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed among the Hellenists. Oh, there's some Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem. Okay, but they attempted to kill him. And when the brethren found out, they brought him out down to Caesarea and sent him out, this is Saul, to uh, Tarsus. But look at verse 27. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And you know what Barnabas did? He told them... Paul's testimony. He said, well, the Lord Jesus appeared to him on the road and he told Paul's testimony. And I think that's interesting because as you've shared your 
testimony. I wonder if there's others that said, hey, you know what? I heard this one man's testimony, and this is how it went. This is how it went. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you just a a little bit of somebody's testimony here in this room. He was at this place working, and it was, uh, I think it was kind of a logging camp thing, and he's working, and there's a shop and mills. I think that's how it went. I don't have it exactly straight. And he goes to this meeting, and the Holy Spirit comes by him. He's converted, and so he goes back uh, on Monday to work, and, and, and in the yard there, and the foreman uh, says, hey, what did you, what happened to you this weekend? Well, I believe the Lord Jesus is my Savior. He says, what? You're kidding. And you know what that foreman did? He decided to mock him, and so he went out into the yard, and he yelled out, and he said, Everybody, this man believed in the Lord Jesus as his Savior. This is the man. And the weird thing is that after that foreman was trying to mock him like that, there were other men coming to him and saying, would you pray for me? So, so God used that foreman trying to mock him to declare a transformed life, and people were seeing it, and all of a sudden he was, I have an assignment. People are coming to me for prayer. Isn't that cool? cool testimony so maybe there's others that are telling your testimony just like Barnabas did but you know what the other thing that Barnabas did is he stuck his neck out for um, Saul right there didn't he kind of like Barnabas reputation If, if Saul turned out to be that murderer that he was earlier before Christ if he all of a sudden flipped around and started going after people, you know, they wouldn't trust Barnabas anymore, would they? But Barnabas stuck his neck out for Saul, and he said, you can trust him. If you can trust me, I'll, I'll give my life. You can trust Saul. He, he has been converted. He belongs to Jesus. Isn't that an amazing thing? And maybe you've done that, too, that you, you've spoken up for someone and said, you know what? He's a friend of mine. He's a friend of mine. And you, if you know me, you, you can trust him. He's a friend of mine. And maybe you've done that. There's another testimony of somebody else in this room. They, um, he walks in to a friend that he knows, and he has this picture of Jesus on the wall. And so he walks up to the counter, and he says to this, this friend of his working here, and he says, say, what's that picture on the wall back there? And the guy at the counter that owned the picture on the wall, he says, oh, that's my best friend. That's a picture of my best friend. Isn't that cool? Now I know pictures are, you know, who knows what Jesus really looked like, right? But he said, this is my best friend. I got his picture hanging on my wall. (laughs) You know, the Holy Spirit uses you exactly where you are and the personality that he's changing from darkness to light to help people to find truth and love and eternal life. So here's, I believe that God is expecting each one of us to be a Barnabas, to be that encouragement. When we walk into a room, we have words of encouragement and hope for people. Instead of talking about how the government stinks and, you know, and the conversation just goes, you know, talk about the hope. Talk about the hope. People need the hope. So when you come into a room, encourage people. And it's, it's contagious. It's a wonderful thing to, to watch somebody's life be picked up because you came in speaking words of truth and life like Barnabas. So here's Barnabas. The third wave was Barnabas. They sent Barnabas. The fourth wave was Saul. Look in your scriptures there. We're we're in Acts. Go back to Acts chapter 11. Look at what Barnabas does. Of all things, Barnabas, that fourth wave, so after the third wave of encouragement, verse 25, Acts chapter 11, 25, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was for 
a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Wow. Wow. Okay. Pivotal place. But that fourth wave, he went to get somebody who was schooled in the Hebrew Bible, who was schooled in God's word, uh, Saul. He was a Pharisee. He, he grew up. He went to school. And so he calls on Saul to come here to this new church and to make sure they get the foundation. Isn't that cool? That fourth wave was, let's get the foundation now that they've been They've received Christ, and it's not just the Jews. Now it's the, the Hellenists. Now they've come to Christ. Now uh, they sent the encouragement. Here's Barnabas. He gets them all encouraged up, and here comes Saul to just make sure they get the foundation down. You've got to get the foundation. So here's, for a whole year, Saul was giving them the foundation. And what was the foundation? It was that the prophecy of the Messiah to come is Jesus. And so he kept telling them that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is Lord of all. So he used all the scripture to back that up. That was the fourth wave. So there's, there's, there's Saul. The fifth wave, look at verse 27 to 30. And in these days, prophets from Jerusalem came to Antioch, to this new church. From Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them was named Agabus. He stood up. Somebody's in trouble. So, Father, we just uh, pray for the responders as they go. Um, somebody's in trouble that needs help, and we just want to ask, Lord God, that you would give them wisdom, Lord God. And, and Lord, we pray that who's ever in trouble, Lord, that they would call out to you and that you would meet them in their need. And for sure, uh, every time something like that happens, somebody's world is just, turned upside down. So we just pray you into that right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So he says in um, 28, one named Agabus stood up and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar, 29. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Verse 30, this they did and sent it also to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. We just experienced five waves of God's spirit advancing the kingdom of God under persecution. Isn't that amazing? So the first wave was to the Jews out there in, in Antioch. And then the f second wave was to the Greek-speaking Jews. And the third wave was Barnabas. And the fourth wave was Saul. And then the fifth wave was a prophet warning the people about something that was going to come so they were able to get ready to help out those people that were going to experience the famine. So I have a question just kind of coming to this last one. How often have you warned people about the, the spiritual danger to come? Uh, you know, maybe you're talking to a, a grandson or a granddaughter and saying, look, I want to tell you, you need to believe in Jesus because the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Outside of that, you're forever separated, so please consider Jesus. Jesus. 